And um, uh, at the first, as a, as my first question, I want you to explain about the classification of the narcissism. And as you completely know that um, very recent classification um, uh, uh, published by Galen O. Gabbard. And uh, as you know, he's talking about the two types of uh, very common narcissism, thinnest, thinnest skin, narcissistic personality, and thickest in narcissistic personality. And uh, I would be so happy if you could explain uh, yeah. about the type of classification and your own classification for narcissistic personality disorder. Thank you. Well, of course, I have, I have the utmost uh, respect for Glenn Hubbard and, and others, but I, I never understood why everyone feels the need to rename <laughs> already well-established and well-observed um, clinical entities. So I don't think, I don't see the need to rename uh, covert narcissism and overt narcissism, thin skin and thick skin. We have a perfectly perfectly stable classific classificatory taxonomic system established uh, in 1989, distinguishing between fragile, vulnerable, shy narcissists, also known as covert narcissists, and the overt, in your face, aggressive uh, narcissists known as overt narcissists. Now, the only difference between these two types, and it is actually the only difference, is that the covert narcissist consistently fails to obtain narcissistic supply. So the covert mm -hmm. narcissist is always in a state, is in a permanent state of collapse. Now to explain some of the terms, narcissistic supply simply means attention by other people, input, feedback, that is used to regulate the narcissist's sense of self-esteem self-confidence, sense of self-worth, the narcissist uses this input from the environment to uphold or buttress or support a grandiose, fantastic, inflated view of himself. And, exactly. And when, when the narcissist fails to obtain this supply, when other people refuse to provide the narcissist with input or feedback, the narcissist goes through a process called collapse. And if the narcissist is in a permanent state of collapse, permanent state of deficient narcissistic supply or not available narcissistic supply, a permanent state of collapse is known as covert narcissism. Apart from this, the covert narcissist is very similar to the overt narcissist. For example, the covert narcissist is grandiose. The covert narcissist has a cognitive distortion. He falsifies reality to support a view of himself which is counterfactual, which is not real, which is delusional and fantastic. Exactly like the overt. Exactly like the overt, the covert narcissist is exploitative, manipulative, Machiavellian, and so on and so forth. Because the covert narcissist is unable to obtain supply directly, the covert narcissist tries to obtain supply indirectly through, for example, other narcissists, by being passive aggressive, by being manipulative. Um, so the covert narcissist is a narcissist that is underground, under the radar, and a constant failure, lives in a state of constant failure and defeat. And so because of that, this kind of narcissist is anxious, shy, fragile, vulnerable, and so on. Mm. Well, that's great. And my ne mm. okay. yes, please go ahead. My next question is, yes, my next question is, um, what's the diagnostic uh, differential diagnostic for the uh, antisocial personality disorder and uh, covert? narcissistic personality disorder, as you know, they are very similar and uh, sometimes very hard to differentiate these two types of personality disorders. Antisocial personality disorder is 
in my opinion at least, not a real clinical entity, not a real mental illness. It is, it is a, an inability to function within society as most people do. Inability to accept social norms and mores and conventions and rules, defiance, recklessness, inability to properly evaluate um, the outcomes or consequences of your own actions, impulsivity, and so on and so forth. It's more of character than a mental illness. It's a character type. It's a personality type rather than a mental illness. Indeed, the diagnostic criteria that define antisocial personality disorder are mostly relational and societal. They're not really psychological. In other words, the diagnostic criteria describe how the person with antisocial personality disorder relates to other people, to society, to authority, and so on and so forth. And so mm -hmm. we have many narcissists who are also antisocial, and they are known as malignant narcissists. Uh, they were first malignant described by Otto Kernberg in 1975. The difference, the two, the major differences between narc uh, narcissists, classic narcissists, and antisocials, including psychopaths, Psychopathy is an extreme form of antisocial personality disorder, although I must say that the profession of psychology or psychiatry did not accept psychopathy as a diagnosis. There yes, is no exactly. psychopathy in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. Exactly. It is a totally extra extracurricular, um, mm. so-called pseudo-diagnosis. Yeah. But yes, the differences, exactly. there are some differences. For example, Narcissists heavily depend, heavily depend, and are addicted to input from other people. Attention. Attention. Psychopath, yes. Narcissists are dependent on other people for, for self-regulation. They need other people in order to regulate their own and, sense of self-worth mm, and emotions. And abuse them. Sorry? Abuse them. Abuse them. Well, the abuse is, is a way to coerce other people to provide narcissistic supply. Mm -hmm. Psychopaths don't need other people at all. They don't need other people. Mm -hmm. They're loners. Most of them are loners. Most of them are, while the narcissist heavily depends on other people for feedback and input and attention and admiration and adulation and so on and so forth. Whereas a psychopath constantly interacts with other people within a shared fantasy or in an abusive relationship. Psych narcissist is always surrounded by many other people. The psychopath couldn't care less about people. The psychopath can spend decades and years alone, totally alone. That's the first thing. The second thing is psychopath is goal-oriented. Psychopath wants mm -hmm. sex, money, access, power, something. Psychopath wants something. And then to accomplish this goal, the psychopath would do anything to anyone. There are no limitations to what mm. the psychopath would do. No inhibitions, mm. no rules, no laws, mm. nothing. The narcissist mm. is not this way. The narcissist is not goal-oriented. The narcissist's only goal is narcissistic supply, attention, being noticed. So the narcissist is not interested in money, the narcissist is interested in money as a way to obtain attention. Mm, narcissist is not, not interested in power. Narcissist is interested to be in a position of power because that way he will get a lot of attention. It's all about mm. attention. Attention. While the yeah. psychopath is interested in money, is interested in power for its own sake. Mm. Not because of the attention, but because he wants power, he wants money. Mm. So these are subtle, subtle differences. The psychopathic narcissist, also known as malignant narcissist, is a narcissist who uses psychopathic strategies and psychopathic techniques in order to obtain narcissistic supply. So mm. it's very misleading because this kind of narcissist appears to be antisocial, appears to be psychopathic, when actually he is not. 
He's just using mm. the psychopath's playbook to obtain supply. That's all. Mm. So these are the differences. I believe personally that all these so-called personality disorders mm. could become one. One personality disorder. One diagnosis. With different emphasis. Different mm. dimensions. And that all of these disorders are actually post-traumatic conditions. Mm. Narcissists, borderlines, they've experienced trauma as children. There are many types of trauma. If, for example, your, your mother is uh, spoiling you, idolizing you, doesn't allow you to interact with your peers, isolate you from reality, it's also kind of trauma. So mm. when a child experiences trauma, some children, not all children, but some children choose dysfunctional solutions such as narcissism, such as codependency, such mm. as borderline. And I think all these so-called personality disorders should be reconceived completely as post-traumatic conditions. Mm. Now, why is this important, how we define them? Because mm. we have no cures, no healing, no, no treatments for personality disorder. We have many, many psychiatrists and psychologists and therapists that claim that they can cure or heal personality disorders. They are liars. They are con artists. <laughs> they are charlatans. <laughs> there, is, Rest. there is no effective treatment modality for personality disorders. With one exception. One exception. Borderline, where we have dialectical behavioral therapy, which is very efficient. Mm. That's the only exception. Otherwise, we cannot treat antisocial personality disorder. We have zero results with narcissistic personality disorder. Mm -hmm. We can modify some behaviors in the short term period. Mm -hmm. So if we think of these conditions as personality disorders, we give up. There's no hope. But if we were to think of these conditions as post-traumatic conditions, we have mm -hmm. many very successful therapies for trauma many but we are not using them when a narcissist comes to you you're not using trauma therapy you're using cbt you're using you know but you're not using trauma therapies which we have and they're great they're working wonderfully so if you redefine narcissistic personality disorder as a trauma condition maybe there is a cure maybe we can help the patient you know but you need to reconceive. You need to change software <laughs> the way you see the, mm -hmm. the situation. Additionally, one last comment. When a narcissist comes for treatment, there is a, there is a, a mistake of treating the narcissist as if he were an adult. When a narcissist mm -hmm. sits in your clinic, you try to create a therapeutic alliance with the narcissist. You, you you make a plan with the narcissist, a treatment plan with the narcissist. You agree on goals of the therapy. You then mm. make an alliance or a contract with the narcissist as to how the therapy will progress. This is nonsense. The narcissist is a two-year-old. These are all cases of arrested development. These, mm. these people that look like adults, they are not adults. They're children. And so we need to use child psychology with mm -hmm. narcissists and with borderlines. We need to use child psychology, not adult psychology. These are not adults. You know. mm -hmm. But in this politically correct age where you're not allowed to say such things, you know, unfortunately, especially in the West, uh, there is mega failure, massive failure, we are unable to give help to these patients because we insist mm. that they have a problem with their personality and they are adults, when actually mm. they have a problem with trauma and they are children. So, of course, they're getting mm. the wrong treatment and, of course, they are not getting, <laughs> there are no results. Mm. Oh, interesting, interesting. And um, another question come to my mind that uh, uh, what is the diagnostic uh, differentiate between the hysterionic personality and mm, 
this kind of narcissistic personality disorder. As you know, the common uh, characters between these two types of personality disorders, attention seeking. And as you know, the hysteric personality needs attention. And as you mentioned and well explained, the narcissistic needs attention and admiring. So what is the differential diagnostic for these two types of personality disorders? I don't think there is. I just said that I think all these so-called different diagnoses should become one diagnosis. Mm -hmm. I think um, each person develops a need for a highly specific type of supply. Each person has his own drug or her own drug. Yeah. But, and then each person goes about obtaining narcissistic supply in different ways. But if we, we should look at the commonalities, for example, People with histrionic personality disorder misjudge reality badly. For example, they misjudge the nature of a relationship. They think the relationship is very intimate when it's not. So there is uh, impaired reality testing. There's a problem with reality testing with in histrionic personality disorder. And the same in narcissistic personality disorder. The narcissist misjudges reality dramatically. Here's one common element. The other common element is the need for attention. The next common element between histrionic and borderline is emotional dysregulation. The histrionic mm -hmm. and the borderline are emotionally dysregulated. They're dramatic. The drama queens or kings, you know, they're very dramatic. Mm -hmm. All these types, narcissistic, histrionic and borderline, they use external regulation. In other words, they use other people input from other people to regulate their internal environment. The narcissist uses input from other people to regulate his sense of self-worth. The mm -hmm. borderline uses input from other people to regulate her emotions and moods. And the histrionic uses input from other people to regulate her intimacy needs and her grandiose self-perception as irresistible, sexually mm -hmm. mainly irresistible. So they yeah, are all exactly. using they're all using external input and external feedback to regulate the internal environment. I think this is such a striking common denominator that we mm. should seriously begin to think that it's one disorder with different manifestations, different aspects. Mm. Now we have this, for example. Exactly. We have this, for example, in psychotic disorder. In psychotic disorders, mm. we, we have a common construct, the psychosis. And then we have different manifestations of psycho psychosis. We have this in, other, in exactly. other fields in psychology. We have this. Eating disorders. Eating disorders, we have a common denominator of you know, the need for control and so on. And then we have different types of eating disorders. But they are one. Eating disorder is a single construct. Psychosis is a single construct. Only in personality disorders, we don't regard them as a single construct, but we say each one of them is totally separate, has nothing to do with the others. And what is the outcome of this nonsensical thinking? That you have to diagnose multiple personality disorders in the same individual. So you have mm. comorbidity. Yes, it's very yes, difficult. Yes. Very typical to diagnose borderline and narcissistic and sometimes psychopathy in the same person. Yes, so exactly. something is wrong. Something is seriously wrong in this approach, you know. Mm. Exactly, exactly. And as you know, in Axis 1, there are several comorbidities, but um, most of the uh, experts in this area and the psychotropists believe that the and most of the comorbidity belongs to the axis one, but as you know, they're trying to have an, a, a neat and strict diagnostic for the personality disorder. That's in, interesting. And uh, I, I, please, Here's the please. thing, the variety, the variance, the variance in depression, for example, is much mm -hmm. bigger than the variance in personality disorder. In other words, the family of depressive disorders, depressive illnesses, 
contains many, many variants of depression that mm. have little to do with each other. For example, dysthymia and major depression have almost nothing to do with each other. Yet they're all called depression. In personality yes. disorders, the disorders are much closer, much, much closer than in depression. And yet we refuse to unify them. Why? We unified all the depressive disorders and we call all of them depression. Even though they are much different to each other than personality disorders. So, you know, we should have one personality disorder with different manifestations. And indeed, the 11th edition, the 11th edition yes. of the International Classification of Diseases, ICD-11, they are going in this direction. They are unifying all the personality disorders with different uh, emphasis. They call it emphasis. So you would have a diagnosis of personality disorder with narcissistic emphasis, with borderline emphasis. Mm -hmm. But they have so much in common that it is crazy to separate these diagnoses totally against all clinical practice. Ask any practitioner, they will tell you, that a patient can be one day borderline, the next day narcissistic, and the next day psychopath. And then again borderline. Exactly. exactly. Anyone will tell you this from clinical practice. Anyone. You know? And also schizoid. And some days the same patient will be paranoid. You know? Anyone will tell you this. So these distinctions, this so-called differential diagnosis, they're mm. wrong. They're wrong. They are opposed to all clinical practice. Absolutely. I don't know where these people, these people are academics. They don't have clinical experience. You know, the clash between academic knowledge and clinical experience lately is enormous. Take, for example, the issue of narcissism. If you talk to clinicians, they would tell you that every narcissist is sometimes overt and sometimes covert. Every clinician will tell you this. But if you talk to academics, sense. talk to academics who have never treated a patient in their lives, they will tell you it's not true. Uh, mm. Narcissist is either this or this. Recently, yes. fortunately, it's, going, it's beginning to change. But, you know, the, there is a breakdown between academic knowledge and clinical experience, which is very, very detrimental to the field. Because in this cousin in this break, in this abyss between academe and clinical practice, you have self-styled experts on YouTube. And people are listening to these people, to these ex so-called experts on YouTube because they are getting different information from academics and from clinicians. So they don't know who to trust. So they go online and they listen to total frauds and charlatans and Nonsense, unbelievable nonsense. The amount it's of nonsense sense. in narcissism is mind boggling. Mind boggling. I would say that 98% of all the information on narcissism online is nonsense, misinformation, wrong. That's bad. Makes sense. Bad. This may make sense to me because. Um... As an uh, Iranian psychoanalyst, and you know, in psychoanalysis, we just believe in three classification neurosis, psychosis, and the pervert. And this kind of classification, uh, I, I think that is, is very helpful in clinical setting because this uh, prevent for stigmatize uh, our, our clients. And as you completely know, the DSM 5 and the ICD 10. Um, is uh, creating for uh, the drug uh, industries, the psychiatric drug industries, and uh, insurance uh, companies also. Yes, insurance, and they have, uh, they must have an diagnosis because they have a cure, and the cure is the kind of drugs, and they have to sell the drugs. And as you know, the lack of uh, very well explain this kind of uh, yes, conflict. Yes, yes. Also, the insurance company insisted. They said, if you want me to reimburse you as a therapist, you want me to 
you need to tell me what is the diagnosis. Give me a number. Exactly. Give me a number. Exactly. Money. It's money. I have to provide. I had. I have to provide a code, a diagnostic code. code. Exactly. Otherwise, you will not get paid. So it's money, money, one hundred percent money. It's not yeah. science. It's money. You know the Diagnostic money, and yes. Statistical Manual Committee that was sitting for ten years to write the fifth edition, edition five. They created wonderful new text for narcissistic personality disorder, for borderline personality disorder, and so on. Paranoid, antisocial. They created wonderful new texts, much better than the DSM-4. But they were put under such enormous political and money pressure that they decided to maintain the text of the DSM-4 in the DSM-5. This has exactly. never happened before. And they put the new texts the new much improved text, much better text, they put them at the end as appendices. So you find, for example, uh, you find alternative model of narcissistic personality disorder that is on page 767 of the fifth edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual and the diagnostic criteria of edition four. So you must diagnose by edition four. If you want to, mm. in the evening, when you have free time, you can read the alternative model, which is 100 times better than the DSM-4. I swear to you, much better. Reflects the latest knowledge and so on. So, yes, the money corrupted the profession completely there, in my view. Exactly. And coming back to the scientific aspect of our uh, discussions. I, I, I'm, I'm think that you are supporting from the Freud uh, opinion about the narcissistic because he believes that they are uncurable. The versus the um, cohort that believes, and as you know, me, he, he well known as a Mister Psychoanalyst in in, in his time. The United States, and uh, um, I, I'm I'm sure that you are uh, very well know all of his publication, and as because you are talking about the kind of collapse, and as you know, the collapse belongs to the court, and court believe that we have to uh, try to um, grow this kind of collapse in this kind of personality. But um, my question is how you can mm, match these two opinions because you are believing in the kind of collapsing personality growing and as and as at the same time you believe that in the freud opinion about the uncurable uh, narcissistic personalities we i will answer you but we have to sign off now and click on the same link we have to sign exactly off because there are two minutes left Okay. No problem. No problem. Okay. Here I'm signing off. Uh, please, please uh, click on your link five minutes from now because there, there needs time to save the session. It is saving the session. Okay. Okay. In this, by, by this link. Same link, but five minutes from now. Give it time to save the session. Thank you. See you soon. Thank you. Thank you. And I will answer. I will attempt to answer your question as I see it. Okay. Are you recording? You ready? Uh, let me click on the record. I cannot see the bottom. Oh, record, yes. Okay. Oh, I, I sent you a request for recording. Yes, I allowed you to record. I allowed you to record. You can record now. Record on. Okay. Recording this computer. You're recording. You're recording. That's correct. Okay. Well, so um, there have been shifting shifting perceptions of uh, narcissism. As far as Freud was concerned, 
narcissism was a misallocation of cathexis, a misallocation of emotional investment, emotional energy. Exactly. So Freud said that it was normal and healthy to cathect yourself, to be invested emotionally in yourself, including erotically, including sexually, because the libido is comprised <clears throat> of a sex drive and a life force. So if you di direct your libido at yourself, then of course you become your own sexual object and also um, your life force is internalized. So he said, this is healthy. This is a, good, a, a very important and necessary stage in personal development and growth. But if this continues beyond a certain point into adulthood and so on, then it becomes pathological and dysfunctional. So as far as Freud was concerned, narcissism in itself was not a pathology. It was as long as it was age appropriate. But if you mm -hmm. continued to invest your emotional energy and so on and so forth in yourself, when you grow up, when you grow up, when you became an adult, that's when the pathology, that's when it becomes pathological. So this was a cathexis approach, approach of emotional investment. Then Jung came along and Jung said that narcissism actually is never pathological. Narcissism mm -hmm. has to do with introversion. It is an integral part of personal development and, and growth, and so on and so forth. Kohut, in the 1970s, mind you, much, much, much later, medicalized. Medi he created self-psychology, and he medicalized, in effect, uh, narcissism. He coined the phrase narcissistic personality disorder. And he was the first to describe narcissistic injury in terms that today we would call narcissistic mortification. And he suggested that narcissistic injury, which today we call mortification, could be an engine of healing and growth in, in narcissism. And with this, I fully agree. Mortification provides a window of opportunity for self-reflection and introspection and perhaps some dynamic change in the narcissist. But mortification is very rare and narcissistic defenses immediately kick in to somehow compensate for the modification. So you need to be an extremely skilled therapist <laughs> to make good use of modification because your window is small and is closing fast. Mm -hmm. These were three different approaches to narcissism, totally different approach. And we haven't made peace. We haven't created an integrative framework, which is precisely what I'm trying to do. I'm not sure that I'm successful, but that is my agenda, at least, to somehow integrate all these insights into a single framework. And that's why you, that's why you ask me, some elements are from Freud, some elements are from, from Kohut, some elements from Jung, and many, many elements from object relation schools, object relation schools, such as Cantrip and Fairburn and uh, Winnicott, Donald Winnicott and, and others. So I borrowed from all of them. And I try to create an integrative picture, integrated picture, synth synthesize everything into a deeper understanding of narcissism as a post-traumatic condition. And to accomplish this, I use the concept of fantasy. Fantasy not only as a defense a mechanism, but fantasy as an organizing principle. Fantasy is a narrative that rules the narcissist's life. Fantasy is an artificial environment, also known as paracosm, into which the narcissist tries to force other people to, to belong. He, he tries to introduce other people, coerce them into the fantasy. And so I recast narcissism as a post-traumatic condition that the solution was to give up on reality and to substitute for it with fantasy and then to try to convert everyone to this new religion of fantasy and to make them members of the fantasy, figments of the fantasy. This is very similar to a cult. 
It's a cult approach, mm. in effect. And I borrow heavily from cult psychology. I also borrow heavily from the psychology of religion. And taking into account where you are, I'm going not going to discuss this very deeply. But suffice it to say that I consider narcissism as a form of religion. Think about it this way. The child is traumatized. So what the child, or abused. So what the child tries to do, the child creates a God. The child creates a deity, a divinity. And this divinity, this God, this new God, is the false self. The false self is everything the child is not. The false self knows everything. It's all-knowing. It's omniscient. The false self is all-powerful, is omnipotent. The false self is perfect and brilliant. The false self is God. The child invents a primitive religion with a God head, with a God figure. And then the child starts with human sacrifice. It's a pagan religion. Pagan. <laughs> The child sacrifices, first and foremost, himself. It's a human sacrifice. The child mm. sacrifices to the false self, the true self. And then the child goes, when the child becomes an adult, the child continues with human sacrifices. His mm. intimate partners, his children, his friends, they're all sacrificed to the false self like human sacrifice. It's a religion. That's why the narcissist keeps creating cults based on fantasy, sects. Amazing. This, cult, this cult can have two people, the narcissist and his wife. This cult can have 40 million people, Donald Trump and his followers. So the cults, the size of the cult doesn't matter. The principles are identical. There's a fantasy, a central fantasy, and everyone is forced to belong to that fantasy, to conform to it. When you think of fantasy as the glue in the understanding of narcissism, suddenly everything fits because the fantasy demands cathexis, emotional investment. This is Freud. The fantasy is, uh, um, is self-centered, it is internalized. The fantasy involves introjects, involves internal objects. That is Jung and the object relation schools. And the fantasy, exactly. fantasy, when it is challenged, especially dramatically, especially publicly, creates modification and injury, an opportunity for some transformation. And that is Kohut. So mm. I unified everything in a new framework, which involves fantasy as the core. And every mm. known, every, everything I know about narcissism from all these schools, not only Freud and not only psychoanalytic and psychodynamic schools, but social learning, Bandura's social learning, and many, many other schools I borrowed from trauma schools and from, I once counted and I borrowed from well over 37 treatment modalities and, and dozens of schools of psychology to create the coherent... Amazing coherent theory of narcissism that I'm proposing. But one thing is important to understand. It's not a theory of narcissism. It's a theory of a new psychology because narcissism mm. is at the center and at the core of literally every known mental illness and every known mental process and every known mental trait. All psychology is founded mm. on narcissism. As long as we define narcissism as a pathology or dysfunction or problem with cathexis and so on, we didn't see this. But the minute you define narcissism as a religion and an alternative to reality, you suddenly realize everything is narcissism, maybe with the exception of biological disorders like schizophrenia. Yeah, I'm not talking about that. And even in schizophrenia, even in schizophrenia, Amazing. you have grandiose psychosis many psychotics are very grandiose exactly and and even with psychosis you have the same situation like narcissism psychotics and narcissists 
cannot tell the difference between internal objects and external objects. They cannot tell the difference between inside and outside, reality and fantasy. It can even, this work, what I'm doing, can even explain psychosis deeply. Of course, there's always a genetic component. There is biochemical component, neurobiological component. The body is always involved. Everything is mediated through the brain. Of course, the body should be involved and medicine should be involved. But when we try to explain how we experience our brain, not what is happening in the brain. Yeah, okay, many things are happening in the brain. But how do we experience this? Then we come to psychology. Psychology is how we experience our bodies, our physiology, and our brain. We call it mind, you know, we call it psyche. That's simply the way we experience the processes and everything, the work of our brain. And, and it's a meta description, meta level, another level. You know. And so on that exactly. meta level, narcissism can explain everything. I can use narcissism, my work on narcissism, I mean, I can use it to easily explain psychosis and borderline and narcissism and psychopathy and bipolar and, I mean, you name it, depression. I can explain everything with this simple, relatively simple principle. Mental illness is about renouncing reality and adopting fantasy, period. With this simple principle, mm. I can explain everything. And from this simple principle, I can derive numerous treatment modalities for almost everything. Now, Freud at the time tried to do the same thing with the concept of conscious and unconscious. He said that all the processes, there are processes in the unconscious that you know need to be brought to consciousness and so on. And a reaction and all this. It was the same. Freud was trying to create a unifying principle. And he didn't succeed so much, I think. And I think he didn't succeed to, so much because he started off with some wrong thing, the wrong assumptions, my view. I know it's considered considered arrogant to criticize uh, Freud and so on and so forth, but I think we need we need to do it. A hundred years have passed, you know, we know a little more. Freud started with the pleasure principle and with sex as the exclusive explanations of human psychology. And I think that limited him. He was a genius, an unequal genius, but even a genius can fall prey to his own assumptions. So Freud assumed that everything is about sex and everything is about the pleasure principle, initially. Much, much later, about 20 years later, he introduced the reality principle, much later. So then he said there was a conflict between the reality principle and the pleasure principle. And he had to invent a whole, a whole bivy, a whole set of structures, the id, the superego, the ego, this, that. He never gave up really on his original explanations of human psychology, which were patently wrong, I'm sorry to say. And I'm not the only one who is saying this, of course. Patently wrong. No, you cannot reduce all of human psychology to sex. I'm sorry to say. <laughs> and you cannot reduce all of human psychology to the pursuit of pleasure. Yes, pursuit of pleasure is important, but I'm not even sure it's the most important thing, I think people do many, many things not because of pleasure and what, not with the anticipation of pleasure. They go to war, they sacrifice, they, they do many things. They are altruistic. All these behaviors are not commensurate with the pleasure principle. Mm. So that's why Freud failed in his project of a unified theory of psychology, because his assumptions were too narrow. And his perception of people, I think, was substantially wrong, I think. Mm. As you know, uh, later Freud published a book um, named The Beyond the Pleasure Principles. 
and uh, because of his challenge with the sadomasochistic clients that they uh, challenge with the pleasure principles and he tries to explain that uh, this kind of client try to get a pleasure from their pain and sufferings yeah. that was Freud's Complete. mistake he never gave up on this he never to the day he died never gave up on the importance of sex the centrality of sex and the pleasure principle and Jung broke up with Freud because of that there was a debate and Adler Adler the same he broke up with Freud because of that Everyone ended up breaking up with Freud because of this obsession with, and so on. So what I'm proposing is a unified theory of psychology, clinical psychology, a unified theory that is based on the dichotomy between reality and fantasy. Mm. So I think it's a much bigger, much bigger principle that can accommodate many variations of human behavior. Mm. Yeah. this makes sense yes uh, my uh, the question um, is um, as you believe that the narcissistic personality disorder is uncurable as the same as the Freud but um, the question is uh, is the uh, narcissistic injury and as you know the first reaction when someone feels that his or her optimal narcissistic uh, capacity um, injured by someone else. Um, is there any clinical approach to cure this kind of narcissistic injury? Yeah. First of all, we should distinguish narcissistic injury from narcissistic modification. Narcissistic injury just generates narcissistic defenses, such as devaluation or, or aggression, externalized aggression. Aggression, yes, aggression. So narcissistic injury is a localized event. It's highly specific, and the narcissist has a highly specific reaction, and then it's over. It's forgotten. Narcissistic modification is when the totality of the narcissist's uh, false self, when the totality of this delusion, this narrative, is challenged in public in front of it, in people that matter to the narcissist and in a humiliating way. So it touches the shame. The shame is the core of narcissism. It releases the shame. And the narcissist is so overwhelmed that the narcissist becomes clinically indistinguishable from borderline. He becomes emotionally dysregulated with mortification. At that point, Therapeutic intervention is possible because all the narcissist defenses are down. They are deactivated. The narcissist is in a state of decompensation. So he's totally decompensated. He's suicidal. He's emotionally dysregulated. And there's a window of opportunity. If there mm. is therapeutic intervention in that minute, and it, the therapist knows what he's doing, <laughs> because it's a very complex condition, then some transformation can be affected. Mm. If, however, the narcissist is left on his own or the therapist doesn't know what he's doing, the narcissist will create in due time two types of defenses against the mortification. One is known as internal defense and one is known as external defense. They were first described by Libby. Internal defense means I am in control. I made them do it to me. They humiliated me, they shamed me, they disgraced me. Yes, but I pushed them to do it. I wanted them to do it. I controlled the whole situation. This is internal defense. Mm -hmm. So this restores the grandiosity and at that minute, the therapist can do nothing anymore. The narcissism is restored. Mm -hmm. The other defense against mortification is these people are evil. They're animals. They misbehaved, they conspired against me, they are malevolent, they deserve to be punished, and I'm going to punish them. The vindictive, vindictiveness. So then again, the narcissism is restored. There is a very narrow window of opportunity before these defenses are activated. 
And yes, theoretically, if you catch the narcissist at that specific say, second and give him the right tools, and yeah, then it's possible. And so I came up with a new treatment modality called therapy. I'm not allowed to mm. practice it because I'm not a licensed therapist. So I never practice cold therapy, but I teach it to therapists. Cold therapy re-traumatizes the narcissist. This is not my, my invention. It is the, the work of FOA, mainly. So cold therapy, FOA, F-O-A, is a scholar. So I re-traumatize the narcissist. I create artificial modification. Artificial mm. modification. In the, in the therapy. And then when the narcissist is in a state of modification in a controlled environment in the therapy, I then intervene. I, I don't intervene. I teach therapists to intervene. So there is intervention at that moment. So I said to myself, mm -hmm. why should we wait 40 years until the narcissist is mortified? Or maybe we'll never be mortified. Why don't we create modification in the therapy, in the, in the clinic? You know, and so the, the narcissist comes, there are, there are a set of procedures and techniques to traumatize the narcissist so that we recreate the primary trauma. The narcissist then disintegrates, decompensates. It's very dangerous time. Narcissist becomes suicidal, emotionally dysregulated. So there needs to be constant supervision on the therapist and the therapist with the narcissist. Three layers, two layers. Yes. And it's very dangerous, very dangerous game, but no other way to reach the therapist, the, the, sorry, the narcissist, no other way. You need to destroy these mega structures of defenses, resist resistances, and you need to destroy them. There's no other way. And the only way to do this is to create artificial, artificial modification. Then the narcissist goes through another process of learning and growing. Never mind all that. We have a chance at least. Then we have a chance. At least. That's that's the philosophy behind cold therapy. This, this makes sense. And then, yeah, I, I believe so. That because it's very dangerous and I'm thinking that it's a very hard technique. It's a kind of attack to the uh, narcissistic organization. And we so, may... Uh, sometimes expect the narcissistic aggression and rage. And as you know, I, I, I'm, I'm reminding a famous sentence from the Winnicott. The most important thing is not retaliating. Sometimes the client mm, feel that we are retaliating his grandiosity by attacking him or her. Yes, I'm, uh, I'm, it is a very dangerous technique. And it's dangerous. amazing. <laughs> dangerous to the therapist, dangerous to the client. But um, many people, narcissists reach rock bottom. Narcissists lose mm -hmm. all their friends, all their money, their family, their their freedom very often. They, they have nothing to lose, you understand? Nothing to lose. It's a cancer of the soul. Cancer of the soul. Chemotherapy and radiation in, in cancer, they're destructive. They destroy your body. But there's no other way to fight cancer. So in exactly. therapy with narcissists, we can do one of two things. We can collaborate with the grandiosity of the narcissist. We can collaborate. Mirroring, can, mirroring a state. We can also challenge the narcissist. We can say, you are definitely intelligent enough to accomplish this change, no? You are powerful enough to control yourself or to transform yourself. So we are collaborating with the narcissist's infantile grandiosity to induce change. Mm. Or we destroy the grandiosity by, by frontal attack, which is called therapy. It's, uh, I have, from 28 years of experience in, in this field, you know, I have come to the conclusion that collaborating with the narcissist's grandiosity can obtain short-term behavior modification. But it is short-term, and then it rebounds. The narcissist grandiosity becomes even, even more. And then mm. the therapist becomes an enemy, a persecutory object. Mm. And the narcissist confronts the therapist. There's also counter-transference and so on. We'll not talk about this. But, you know, I don't 
I don't know of any effective modality. I'm sorry to say, I wish I could. I don't know. Core therapy perhaps is the last last chance. It's just to bombard the cancer with radiation and chemotherapy and, you know, and hope for the best. Hope for the best. There is also a question, um, ethical question. When the narcissist is left without his grandiosity, what is left? How the narcissist then becomes clinically a borderline? He doesn't have defenses against the external world, and the external world can dysregulate him very often. And also the narcissist doesn't have any other coping strategies and mechanisms. That's all he knows. He knows just fantasy, grandiosity. You know. If you take this away from him, what do you have? You have a two-year-old child who is emotionally dysregulated all the time. So the aftercare, after the, th the cold therapy, there must be another stage, aftercare, to help the, ther the, the narcissist to somehow evolve into an adult with some more functional defenses. Because we all have defenses, of course. We all have uh, psychological defense mechanisms. We all falsify reality. You know. We all, in this sense, pathological in some sense. You know. But there are good, I mean, there are uh, levels of pathology. The narcissism is a pathology of absence. The narcissist doesn't exist. There is an emptiness, empty schizoid core, exactly like borderline. And the narcissist is an absence pretending to be a presence. What is this pretension? The fantasy. There's nothing to the narcissist except the fantasy. Take away the story, take away the narrative, nothing there. It's like you, you see this beautiful robe and there is a human figure in the robe. But when you take away the robe, there's nothing there. So it's a terrifying condition, honestly. It's a terrifying condition for the therapist as well. Because don't underestimate what a narcissist can do to a therapist. Don't underestimate. There is vicarious trauma. Narcissists can traumatize therapists. They often do. And narcissists tap into the therapist's shadow, into the therapist's own defense, narcissistic defenses. Narcissists trigger therapies. To work with a narcissist is a very yes. dangerous proposition for the therapist. Narcissists are very good at finding your buttons, pushing them, for your vulnerabilities, exploiting them, corrupting the therapy, contaminating the process. They're very good at this. And so you're faced with a serious enemy when you are with a narcissist. You, there's no alliance here. Forget this total nonsense of therapeutic alliance. Certain alliance is a war. Yes. A war. And as you know, most of the tropics um, um, refuse for visiting this kind of client. They refer to the other tropists because they know how they can attack to the tropist optimal narcissism and they know as a very high level boxer that the weakness of the everyone and where can put the face as a very these are these are predators book. they're predators and they regard everyone as, as prey not, the therapist is prey also is a victim potential victim so they, th exactly. this is reflexive. This is not, narcissist is not like psychopath. So psychopath is planning, cunning, scheming, premeditated, and, and intentional, deliberate. Narcissist is not like that. Narcissist is like a virus. It's, it's reflexive, it's instinctive, instinctual. You know? And so he will find your vulnerability. He will find your chinks and he will push your buttons and he will make you disintegrate if you're not careful. As a therapist, but how how they know this kind of because they have something ability? they have something that I call cold empathy. Cold empathy is combination of cognitive empathy and reflexive empathy, mm -hmm. but no emotional component. 
so they can scan you and they will empathize with you cognitively and analyze you and so they will know everything about you but it will not provoke in them any emotion for example the narcissist will scan you and say this is a very sad person but the narcissist will not be sad for you will not empathize with you he will just say wonderful this is a sad person I can push the sad button. I can push him to be more sad. And that exactly. way I will, have con I will have control over him. I will manipulate him through his sadness. Mm. So it's all a situation of control. It's about control. Of course, narcissists are terrified of losing control because as children, they lost control. So mm. it's all about control. They need to control you, but the extent of the control is not like the psychopath. The psychopath wants to control you to take your money. So the control is limited. They control you for the money. And then they take the money, they lose interest. They go. The narcissist wants to control you to the point that you don't exist anymore. That you cannot threaten the control. If you disappear, the control is total. So the narcissist converts you into an internal object, introjects you, makes you an internal object, and then narcissist interacts with the internal object only, not with you. You cease to exist. So the control in the case of narcissist, narcissism is absolute, total. Narcissist wants you to, to become ancient Egyptian mummy. You know, nothing less. Because only then the narcissist can be sure that you are under control, that you will not abandon him, for example, that you will not betray him, that you will not challenge him, that you will not attack his grandiosity. This sorry, is... an... I'm sorry? There was an interruption. Yeah, short, one, one second. Don't worry about it. Yes. Amazing, amazing explanation about the kind of attacking yes but in uh, our iranian culture uh, we cannot see a lot of uh, narcissistic persons who come to the trophy and when they come because of the pressure of their family and the pressure of the friends colleagues and maybe in maybe maybe job issues and conflicts and most of the time they, they feel injured and in, in an aggressive state same in, come the to the... same in the west same exactly oh. narcissists come to therapy because the court told them to go because the prison told them to go because the wife wife told them to go or she will leave or because of the family or they are forced they are forced to come to therapy and they don't come to therapy because they think they have any problem they don't have any problem <laughs> they come to therapy yes. because they have to and sometimes they come to therapy because they hope that you will make them better narcissists. They hope to learn mm. from you all kinds of techniques and how to how to be better at manipulating people and, and so on and so forth. So, so it's a collusion. And they try to corrupt you and contaminate you. They offer you money. They offer you to do business together. They offer to make you famous, make you famous on television. They, they contaminate yes. the therapy process. They try to bribe you corrupt you, you know. this is yeah. these are all these are all narcissistic uh, situations and techniques and this is why it's very difficult to work with narcissists in therapeutic settings very very difficult yes borderlines are not the same borderlines are very crazy and everything but borderlines are they have a soul if you wish they have emotions they have empathy they are dysregulated. They sometimes are very aggressive. So they can accuse you of misbehavior, for example, whatever. It's very common that borderlines accuse the therapist of sexual misbehavior, things like that. So they're a bit dangerous, but at least you feel that you're working with a human being, full-fledged human being, maybe disrupted human being, disordered human being, but Still, human being, recognizable human being, human being in need, human being in distress, human being in, you know, when you work with borderlines, 
But when you work with narcissists, it's, I don't know, it's a bit of a feeling of an alien. I don't know, it's, some human elements are really missing, really. You're not supposed to say this in the profession. You're not supposed to say this. <laughs> everyone is human, everyone is okay. But let me ask you this. The narcissist has no empathy, emotional empathy. And the narcissist has no access to positive emotions. Narcissists cannot love, for example. If you take away emotions and empathy, what is left? What is left to be human? Computers. Nothing. Computers compute. Artificial intelligence writes poetry. <laughs> the only thing that separates us from the machines and from animals is consciousness, empathy, and emotions. If you take away consciousness, because the narcissist is not conscious, he denies reality. He is stuck in fantasy. He has no consciousness. He has no awareness. If you take this away, and you take empathy away, and you take emotions away, what is left to define a human being? What? Nothing, Nothing. much. That you have two legs and two arms? Many robots today have two legs and two arms. That doesn't make you a human being. Nothing. And this is why Nothing. when you go online, when you go online, the victims, they're going crazy. They're saying, this was a demon. This was a Satan. This was, you know, they, they can't, they can't convey. You know, when I started my work, it was 1995. 1995. There was no language for Nazis. None. I invented most of the language that is used today. I invented narcissistic abuse. I invented somatic narcissism, cerebral, I mean, no contact, and all this, uh, go, uh, no, flying monkeys, uh, hoovering, all this I invented. Why did Amazing. I invent? Why did I invent this language? Because there was no language. There was no way to communicate the experience, you know? And even today, after almost 30 years, there is still no language. The experience is still so outside human typical life that the victims cannot communicate what happened to them. They, they are going crazy. They are using demons and Satan and I don't know what, because, not because they are religious, or, but because they lack the language. There's no language to describe this experience. It's really out of this world in many ways. You know. And exactly. you have narcissists today everywhere. You have narcissists in politics. You have narcissists in show business. In, they're taking over. They're multiplying. They're proliferating. Definitely. That's not some vaccine. There are studies by Twenge and Campbell and many others that show that the incidence and prevalence of narcissism is increasing dramatically among young people. Women today are much more narcissistic than they were 40 years ago. 40 years ago, only 24% of diagnosed narcissists were women. Today, depending on the country, it's 40 to 50%. The, the prevalence and, and incidence of narcissism among women has doubled. Doubled. Mm -hmm. I would like to have a second conversation with you where I would interview you. I'm very curious. Uh, I'm very curious to hear about the practice of psychoanalysis and, and generally therapy in Iran. I'm very curious to hear. I believe many other people are curious. So if you don't mind, we could have a second conversation where we would discuss psychology therapy in Iran and how, how the profession in Iran um, deals with various patients and what schools are accepted, what schools are rejected, what schools are dominant, and so on and so forth. I'm very curious about this. So next time, I will shut up <laughs> and you will do the talking, if it's okay with you. Welcome, welcome. And thank you, it is my pleasure to explain you about the current situation and psychotropy practicing and uh, I, as an Iranian psychoanalyst, trying to visit and to 
try to have uh, psychoanalysis sessions with the Iranian clients. Um, most of the, as as you know, we are, we do not have access to any IPA approved psychoanalytic institute in my country, Iran. Mm -hmm. And um, you cannot find a lot of approved, internationally approved psychoanalyzed in my country, but you can find several and highly ranked expert psychoanalysis who graduated from the Western Institute and the universities. Do people generally... Uh, do the main problem... Sorry? Do people generally go to therapy? Is it considered a... Yes. Yes? Yes. These days, because of the social medias and uh, mm, accessing the uh, average people to the social media, they understood the importance of participating in the any kind of psychotropic sessions in my country. And as you know, our main problem as the same as the most of the psychoanalysis and psychotropies in Western country is the mm, uh, tuitions and the payment fee for the psychotropy sessions because the most of the local insurance uh, organization uh, do not support for the psychotropy mental, mental sessions health. and mental health yes and but the most of the Iranian psychology is trying to get uh, governmental support for supporting our own people for and is there a lot of couple their therapy? Their mental health, but uh, uh, I do not practice couple therapy because um, it is very difficult in my country. I believe that uh, the very I, I lose a lot of energy when I with, <laughs> when I was uh, when I used to visit the couples in my uh, clinics. So I have refused to visit the couples. Because they are the their problem are very complex, very difficult to resolve, and uh, it's a very hard situation. And I always mm, uh, admire my colleagues who, <laughs> who are courageous, Iran brave enough. <laughs> in their yeah. I have many many questions for you, but I have to go now. And I would like to talk to you again about the situation of therapy and psychotherapy and and so on in Iran. I have many questions, definitely. So, if you don't mind, we will have a second conversation. I will be happy if you... Yes, it's my pleasure to explain about the uh, current and the most recent uh, psychotropy and uh, uh, the most common problems that my people are facing these days. Amazing. And but which school it, it also... seems that to manage uh, uh, separate time. Yes, please. And also, which schools are dominant in, in Iran? Which schools of psychology are still dominant? And which, you know, which therapies are dominant and so on? It's interesting. Okay, Very good questions. Good questions because uh, the most dominant schools in my country is CBT. CBT. And unfortunately, what happened, CBT, yes, and unfortunately, what happened this day, most of um, the Iranian uh, clients tired of the CBT techniques. They visited by the several CBT therapists. They know all of the technique. They can find the technique <laughs> through the internet. <laughs> and so uh, a kind of... Um, Fatigue. Uh, revolution, Fatigue. I, I think, yes, yes, is happening um, in the atmosphere of the psychology and psychotherapy in my country and most of the Iranian uh, psychology students at the universities trying to touch and participate in the psychodynamic school, psychoanalysis school, and they know that the, most of the people trying to know they're unconscious and uh, tired, they are very tired of uh, the techniques. They are very 
tired of the direct advices, tired of the charts, challenging with the automatic negative thought and so on. I, I, I really do respect to my CBT trophy uh, colleagues, but um, I'm, I'm talking about the what uh, the atmosphere of my city, Isfahan, and the, all of my country in Iran. But we are challenging in uh, with the Iranian client and the Iranian people who come to visit me uh, in uh, with this as psycho psychoanalyzed. The main problem, as the most of the Iranian psychoanalyzed believes, that is the core problem for practicing psychoanalysis and psychodynamic techniques, the Iranian client is free association. Uh, according to our culture and to our uh, literature, uh, someone who want to tell a sentence, he or she has to think before, so and think about the reaction and uh, by uh, this kind of by by considering all of these all of the kind of cultural and literal and the uh, um, background of the Iranian culture, the free association does not happen purely in our sessions. And this actually, is our, our main problem. Actually, Freud experienced Please. an identical, identical problem because the Viennese society, the society in Vienna, uh, when he invented free association, he didn't invent it. Actually, he took it from someone else. Never mind. When he tried to implement free association, the Viennese society was very similar to what you described in Iran nowadays. Uh, it, everyone was thinking before they were talking and what would be the social impact and how would be the reactions. And so he had very big difficulty with this. And he was, uh, exactly. he was he had, I would like to talk to you further. I have to go, unfortunately. But we definitely have a skill. We, if you agree, we will talk again about, about uh, psychotherapy in Iran. Fascinating topic. Yeah. Okay. Sure. This is... Uh... This is very fascinating topics for me too, and this is my uh, pleasure for a second Thank meeting you. and talk about the atmosphere. And I'm referring you to a, a very well-known book who is uh, who is published and written by uh, Dr. Gohar Homayum, who and the famous psychoanalyst who is graduating from Boston Psychoanalyst Institute. And his book named Psychoanalysis in Tehran. And really? <laughs> uh, sorry. And she and she uh, very well explained about the atmosphere of the psychoanalysis in Iran. And she believes that the core conflict and the core problem for everyone who uh, are trying to visit uh, and to practice the psychoanalysis with the Iranian people is that he, he or she has not expect a pure free associations and you are very, very well referred to the Vien, Viennian atmosphere um, yeah. in the Freud history and uh, yeah. it, it makes was a revolution. sense to me. Psychoanalysis was a revolution. Yes. Okay, exactly. thank you very much and we will talk again. Thank you very much. Thank you. Have a nice yes. day. So nice to meet you. Have a nice day. Bye.